All right. Well, let's let's dig into this morning's study. We pick up in the series of teachings on the attributes of God. Last week we considered together God's spirituality. And this morning, we're going to consider together God's eternal decree. <clears throat> so I will read a passage from Jeremiah 9, as has been the custom, and then I'll pray. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Let this be our prayer this morning. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this. That he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Remember, I've said now several times, the most important thing for every man ever born of a woman is a true and saving knowledge of God. And that is our pursuit in these studies. Let me pray. Father, You are the high and lifted up One. Your Son is the exalted Son. Your Spirit is the holy and omnipresent Spirit. Lord, You're here in this place, not because any requires You to be here, but because You're gracious and condescending, and You choose to reveal Yourself to men. We ask that You would do that this morning, or that You would show us more of Your glory, that You would reveal to us more of who You are. Let this not be, Father, for us a mental pursuit only, but a pursuit of the heart. For the purpose of transformation, for the purpose of living to the glory of our God and King. Come and illumine minds now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, this morning I want to take us through uh, many passages from the Bible. Good morning, Kayla. And show us together the beauty of God's eternal decree. Is that a new phrase to any of us? God's eternal decree? Quentin raises his hand. <laughs> well, let's dig right in then. The question is, and I guess Quentin would rightly ask this question, Brother Lee, what? Is God's eternal decree? What do you think of when you think of decree? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Sovereign? Authority? Will? Y'all are such deep theological thinkers. I, I, I think of old stories about kings and they issue a decree. Or King Darius and Daniel issuing a decree. What is God's eternal decree? I'm going to answer that in a variety of ways. Ultimately, the answer will be derived from Scripture, and I think you all will feel the weight of that this morning. But I want to, to begin with an answer from the London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. And this is the third chapter in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And I'm going to read paragraph 1. Chapter 3 is titled, Of God's Decree, and it contains seven paragraphs full of Scripture proofs. I'm only going to read the first one. So, paragraph 1. What is God's eternal decree? God has decreed in Himself from all eternity, by the most wise and holy counsel of His own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty 
or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Now there's, there's a lot there, and uh, we could unpack it over the course of weeks. I want to focus ultimately on the very first portion of this paragraph, and I'll read it again. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever comes to pass. Quentin, that's what God's eternal decree is. It is God's purposes decreed before the foundation of the world, and it encompasses all things that ever come to pass. It is singular in nature, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at a later point. But the London Baptist Confession gives us a, a, a good working definition of God's eternal decree. After reading something like that, what I think is rather comprehensive, and I'll also note that the Westminster shares that very same wording in chapter 3, the definition moves forward, and this is where it might have gotten a little cloudy, uh, and provides three scriptural propositions that, that in a sense they serve as helpful boundaries that are really necessary when one begins to think deeply or philosophize about God's eternal decree or God's secret will. And those were the statements that followed what we're focusing on this morning, that God is not the author of sin, that is a necessary boundary, that God does not coerce men, that is a necessary boundary, and that all of it is driven by his infinite wisdom, that is a necessary boundary. Deuteronomy 29, 29, I think we're all familiar with this verse, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of the law. When we think of God's eternal decree, we should be thinking along the lines of his secret or unrevealed will. Since God's decree is not part of God's revelation to mankind, we only come to know of God's decree as it takes place in time, in history. We can only see God's decree in the past. We never see it in the future. It is only known to Him. And thus, theologians will talk about God's secret will or God's decree, decretive will, they might say, and then on the other hand, God's prescriptive will or His revealed will or His moral will will. Those are the things that he has openly declared. Those are the things that we find contained in the scripture, God's revealed will, whereas his secret will, no man knows. Bible phrases that indicate God's decree is being referenced are as follows. The actual word decree, that makes sense. But also phrases like eternal purpose, the purpose of him, the counsel of his will, of his good pleasure, the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Your plan had predestined according to his purpose and the mystery of his will. All of these phrases are describing God's unrevealed will, his secret will. I think maybe the clearest text in all of Scripture is found in Ephesians chapter 1 when we're thinking of God's eternal decree. It's Ephesians 1.11. And we read, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Y'all picked up on some of those phrases there, didn't you? To the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. 
So God's eternal decree or the divine decree is something that happened in eternity past when God, unmoved by any outside circumstances or forces, determined to create and in a single decree plotted the entire course of all creation. There you go, Quentin. How's that? God did this because he desired to do it. He desired to make himself known to his creatures. He desired to be glorified, which if that bothers anybody here, it shouldn't. This is supremely appropriate for the supreme God. A side note from the Dutch theologian Herman Bobbing. He said, the counsel of God, accordingly, must be considered a single and simple decree. Doesn't seem very simple, does it? At the Westminster Assembly, he goes on to say in 1643 through 1646, the delegates discussed whether to speak of the decree in the singular or in the plural. Should it be decree or should it be decrees? The Westminster Confession only uses the word in the singular, as does the London Baptist Confession of Faith, from which we read from. And indeed, the world plan is one simple conception in the mind of God. Did you hear that? The world plan. You've got city managers. Philip could share a lot about this. And they plan things, parks, shopping centers. In a single decree, God planned predestined, purposed, all of human history. A single decree. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the divine decree, God's eternal decree. There are two classic texts in our Bible. This is just introductory material at this point. There are two classic texts in our Bible that are often cited when undergoing a study of God's eternal decree. One from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45. We'll look at the Old Testament passage first. What's in Genesis 45? Who knows the answer? Did I hear you mumbling something? Joseph with his brothers. Yes. I'm just going to read four verses. Verses verses 5 through 8. And we'll investigate for a moment together. Genesis 45, verses 5 through 8. Joseph here is speaking to those betraying, deceiving brothers. And he says, And now, my brothers, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph is repeating himself here. We're not going to go into the why or his motivations. I want to go into the content of what he is stating. I want you to think of this, brethren. Think of the untold number. Untold is an understatement. The untold number of circumstances that factor into this single moment in Joseph's history. A single moment in history regarding a single man. Think of all that factored into this. A promise to Abraham. And we're just starting with Abraham, right? We could go back to Genesis 1. But a promise to Abraham factored in. I'm going to make from you, sir, a number that is equivalent to the sand on the seashore. I'm going to make from you a people. What about a renewed covenant with Isaac? What about Ishmael being passed by? What about Jacob being chosen over Esau? What about 12 sons that were born to Jacob? 
of which Joseph was the second youngest? What about family strife? Jealous mothers, favoritism from dad, betrayal, deception, slavery, imprisonment, false accusations, injustice, advancement, famine, dreams and interpretations. Think of all the emotions. All the threads that make up this glorious Genesis 45 tapestry. We could go on and on, couldn't we? Yet this is one moment in time. Some observations. What is Joseph communicating? We, we say the statement, I say the statement, theology matters. Do you ever say that statement? If you don't, you should really incorporate it. it it's excellent and meaningful. Theology matters, brethren. And we see that in Joseph's thinking. He, he's not just the second in charge in Egypt, the most powerful land and kingdom in that time. This man is thinking deeply theologically. And he sees things that many believers today do not see. It's remarkable. Four observations that we can derive from Joseph's thinking here. Number one, Joseph understands that God has authored all of his days. Did, did you see that in the text? Yeah, Brothers, you, you sold me here. But big, 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 big picture, guys, God, God did this. God brought me here. God, God ordered all of this nonsense that you guys were a part of. He, he did it all for his own glory. God sent me, he says. And then later he says, not you, but God did this. Secondly, God predetermined these events to take place. You see, Joseph is understanding that, that when his brothers on that fateful day sold him into bondage, slavery in Egypt, God was not responding and saying, okay, how can I rework this? Let's get him into Potiphar's house and then advance him. Oh, wait, then there's Potiphar's wife. God is not responding. God had predetermined these things to take place. God is never surprised by anything, but these events, the ups and the downs of the life of Joseph, was planned by God. Things happen with a purpose. God orders them, and then they work out in time. Joseph understands that here. Thirdly, Joseph understands that God orders history to the extent that even evil men and evil deeds are used to accomplish God's very purpose. Right, this isn't a nice fluffy story. And Joseph, just in great joy and exultation, is able to say, wow, all the wonderful things, this would be Joel Osteen, right? All the wonderful things, it's God, he's done it, he's ordered it. No, Joseph is talking about betrayal by his own brothers and false accusation, and deception, and imprisonment. Uh, these are not just hours of his life. These were years. We're talking about 22 years, approximately, that elapsed from the day he was sold into slavery until this Genesis 45 conversation. But God orders it all. God's sovereignty reaches that far. It encompasses the good and the evil, Think of a couple of verses in our Old Testament, Lamentations 3, 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? This is the prophet Jeremiah. Isaiah. God speaks through his prophet and he says, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Fourthly, God orders events for the good of His people. Joseph is ultra clear here. I mean, this is the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8.28, brethren. Because he says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant. And, and think of what is on the line here. God's promise to Abraham is on the line. 
God's plan of a coming Messiah through Abraham's people is on the line here. I tell you, theology matters. And thus we have what should comfort us right now and for the rest of our days, Romans 8, 28, and we know, and we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. There's purpose in that. God's eternal decree. Now let's go to the New Testament. To the New Testament. We're going to work quickly. Acts chapter 4. I said there were two texts that are chiefly quoted, referenced in a, a discussion like this. And the New Testament passage is Acts chapter 4, verses 26 through 28. This is the prayer of early church believers that are quickly growing accustomed to persecution. They begin the prayer, notably in the ESV, with Sovereign Lord. But look at verses 26 and 27 and 28. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed, for truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. A classic New Testament text, giving us a picture, really, deep insight into God's eternal decree. This is the most crucial point in human history. And God says, I'm going to show you something about that moment in history. This is the climax in the history of redemption. The Messiah crucified for sinners. This was the most evil act ever perpetrated by the children of Adam. What more dark, gruesome, evil sin could we think of than killing the only begotten Son? Crucifying God in the flesh. This was planned from the beginning. That's, that's what verse 28 makes so clear. It's as if Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is documenting the prayers of the saints in that day. And with all clarity, let me make this clear, ultra clear, to do whatever, God, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. So the cross wasn't a surprise. It was an unfolding of God's eternal decree. And we pick up on this, even John the Revelator in Revelation 13 speaks of the Lamb slain from the foundation, from before the foundation of the world. So all of created history has God as its author. Even the fall? Yes, even the fall. We're talking about one single, as Bavink said, simple conception in the mind of God. And it includes all that has ever happened and will happen. All of it, Brother Lee? All of it. Big things, small things, significant things, insignificant things. Yes, even the lot that is cast. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Boy, that's, that's pretty significant. No, it's not. But it too is in God's eternal decree. You, you mean even dying sparrows? Yes. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? A penny? And not one of them 
will fall to the ground apart from your father, Jesus said. Well, that's significant. That doesn't hardly ever happen. It happens all the time. Soulless creatures falling from the sky, they're gone. Oh, yeah, I, I know God knows that. Yep, and more. He decreed it. It's all a part of the eternal decree. And, and yes, even the big things, like the kingdoms of this world, Think of the interaction between Nebuchadnezzar and the eternal king. Daniel 4.32, God speaking, he says, And you shall be driven from among men, Nebuchadnezzar, you proud fool. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know, know what? That the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. It's all included in God's eternal decree. God leaves nothing to chance. God doesn't work based on probabilities. There are no best case scenarios. There are no contingency plans. God doesn't move from plan A to plan B to plan C. Nothing happens at random. His decree is plan A. And it will forever remain the same. God's decree has fixed all history. Genesis 41.32 Joseph again. Speaking to Pharaoh, interpreting dreams. Hear what he says. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. And God will shortly bring it about. Wonderful insight into God's decree. And he had no Bible. Thankfully, we have beautiful revelation that gives us insight into these things. So we, saints, must clearly see that God is never caught off guard. He is never responding to the actions of men. But rather, He has purposed and ordered them all from the very beginning. How else could... Have you ever thought about this? How else could the prophets always get it right? God's prophets... The canonized prophets. How, how could Isaiah prophesy of the birth of the Messiah almost 800 years before it happened? The progression of events throughout human history are simply the unfolding of the means to the end. And all of it from start to finish is under the control, the sovereign control of God. It's His plan. Now there's seven things. That's the introduction. There's seven things that I want to say about God's eternal decree. And we're going to pick up the pace so we can have time for some questions. Seven things. Number one, it's eternal. Hence, God's eternal decree. It's eternal. Number two, it's free. Number three, it's universal. Number four, it's perfectly wise. Number five, it's unstoppably powerful. Number six, it's immutable, a word that we should know well from several weeks ago. And seven, it's all for the glory of God. I'll have a few closing applications. But I just want to help us understand some of the framework of what is God's eternal decree. Quentin, after today, you have no excuse, sir. <laughs> eternal, number one. Well, I quoted earlier the London Baptist Confession of Faith, and one of the early phrases in that confession says, from all eternity. This is an eternal decree. Let's look to the Scriptures and see if this be so. Psalm 119, verse 89 Forever, O Lord, 
your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Isaiah 46, verses 8 through 10. You probably won't be able to keep up, so if you just want to jot down the references, that'd be ideal. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. A mighty statement. Who else can declare the end? From the beginning. Who was even in the beginning. But God. God alone. Think of all the Bible says. Took place. Quote. Before the foundation of the world. I found that reference four times in the New Testament. One time in John 17. Speaks of the love and the communion. Between the son and the father. That high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus. But, but three things that the Bible points out took, took place before the foundation of the world, meaning in eternity past, even though that doesn't make much sense. One, the elect were chosen. Ephesians 1.4 declares that truth. Two, the lamb was slain. John the Revelator, chapter 13, verse 8. Three, Christ as a sacrifice was foreknown. 1 Peter 1.20. All of that before the foundation of the world. But in a sense, brethren, do we see it? God knew everything that was to happen before anything happened. That's God's eternal decree. His decree is His eternal plan. And it relates to every future reality without exception. If it doesn't, it isn't. Whatever is done in time was decreed to take place before there was time. Herman Bavig again. He said, but just as an artist can only execute his vision in stages, so God unveils before the eyes of his creatures the one vision of his counsel in a series of temporal phases. Did, did any of y'all ever watch that PBS show, the guy with the afro, and he would paint there? He'd paint typically some kind of landscape scenes, Leslie's smiling. That guy looked a lot like my dad when I was born. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? He, he does that in phases. It's not like, oh, done, right? Show's over. He does it in phases, and he'd talk about it along the way. Very entertaining. But there's some sense that, that this is what God is doing with human history, right? He, he's decreed it, and now he's simply unfolding all that he has decreed to take place in temporal phases. No clear-thinking man or woman that truly believes that God is omniscient We'll get to that attribute at a future date. But truly believes that God knows all things. That He comprehends all things past, present, and future. Would ever give credence to the doctrine that God authors temporal decrees. Or what in our day and age is often referred to as open theism. Is anybody here familiar with open theism? Joel, Tom, open theism, simply put, is an understanding said by biblical understanding, though it's very unbiblical, that, that God is learning. And that in time, as he is confronted with the scenarios in humanity, he is both learning and responding. He's picking the best option at every fork in the road. It is ugly, it is heretical, it's nonsense. It would be an outright denial of God's eternal decree. And yet, just 
soak in all the passages we're going to be reading together this morning and dwell on these things. Let the Word of God inform your thinking. Secondly, God's eternal decree is free. God was free. London Baptist Confession has two phrases along these lines. First, God hath decreed in himself. That was the opening phrase. Decreed in himself. And then a little bit later, by the most wise and holy counsel of his will, comma, freely. Well, what do we mean when we say God is free? Well, we, we actually spent some time dwelling on that last week when we talked about God's spirituality. And he's, he's free. He's unhindered by outside forces. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13 and 14. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? What, what's the answer to all these questions? No one. No one. No one. A.W. Pink said God was alone when he made his decree. And his determinations were influenced by no external cause. He was free to decree. He was free not to decree. He was free to declare, decree one thing and not another. This is the liberty we must ascribe to the one who is supreme, independent, and totally sovereign. God was free. He had nobody's opinion, nobody's counsel, nobody's input. He didn't submit his decree before a bar to have it reviewed. This was his decree and his alone. He was free in it. Psalm 115, verse 3, says this so clearly. Our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. The works of God that make up the decree of God are not forced upon him or required in any way. He freely chose to do this. He freely chose to create. He initiated it all. Because he was pleased to do it. The Puritan Samuel Willard said, God didn't need anyone else to consult with because he had the sum total of all wisdom in himself. All secondary beings were to be the result of this plan and therefore none of them could participate in it. They weren't yet existing. Revelation 4. Verse 11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The final answer to the question of why things exist as they are is this, God willed it to be so. Jonathan Edwards theologizes slash philosophizes and says, whether God has decreed all things that ever come to pass or not, all that own the being of a God own that he knows all things beforehand. Now, it is self-evident that if he knows all things beforehand, he either does approve of them or does not approve of them. That is, he is either willing they should be, or he is not willing they should be. But to will that they should be is to decree them. He almost works backwards there, doesn't he? And comes to a logical conclusion. God was free. He decreed all things. Thirdly, God's decree is universal, or all-inclusive. Far better than a weekend trip to Cancun, Mexico that's all-inclusive. God's decree is all-inclusive. The London Baptist Confession 
quote says, all things whatsoever comes to pass. That sounds like everything. Ephesians 1.11, I've already quoted it, I'll quote it again. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Psalm 104, verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven, in the earth, in the seas, and all the deeps. It's comprehensive. It's universal. It encompasses everything. Living and non-living. Material, immaterial. Past, present, future. Everything. We cannot say that any more comprehensively. Herman Bavink again, he says, included in this counsel of God are all the things that exist and will occur in time. In short, the whole plan, the blueprint of the intelligible universe. That's what's encompassed in God's eternal and universal decree. Everything. Everything. He would go on to say a paragraph later, the decree is the womb of all reality. There you have it. I definitely couldn't say it any better than that. God's decree is the womb of all reality. Fourthly, perfectly wise. Perfectly wise. I don't think anybody here is going to argue with that, but it, it, it gets personal at times, doesn't it? Some of us, while we're members of Providence Chapel, we're going to die. And those that are left are going to grieve that loss. Some here may lose children. Last year I lost my dad. It, it gets personal, doesn't it? We're not just talking about wars and rumors of wars, famines and distant lands. We're talking about family traumas, car accidents. We're talking about everything. So, so don't walk away saying, oh, that's so out there, that's so impersonal, that's for another day, that's for the armchair theologian. No, bring it home. It's personal. And it's still good. And theology really matters. And God is sovereign. And He is so loving us. And He's so near. You see, all that God does is perfectly wise. Not just the founding of America, but the very needs that David Holslander emailed out to the congregation on Friday. God's in all of those details. Painful ones, triumphant ones, He's in them all. The London Baptist Confession states this. We read it. By the most wise and holy counsel of his will. Most wise. As well in one of those latter phrases in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things. Proverbs 3 verse 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding established the heavens. Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. So this is not simply about creation, but creation and all that flows from it. The timeline of human history. Again, let's, let's bring it home. Let's make this more personal. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Peter, he lifts up his voice on the day of Pentecost and he begins to preach to the very audience of ones that recently crucified the Savior. And as he's preaching this Spirit-empowered, anointed message, he says in Acts 2, 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, 
you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Yes, most wise. You see, this this means that God does nothing rashly. I mean, how can you act rashly when you did the decree before the things even happened? Right? We we act rashly when someone speaks a harsh word, right? And and we respond in, in anger, some degree of rashness. God decreed everything before it began. There's no no need for rashness. He's not responding to anybody. God, in perfect wisdom, means he never makes mistakes. You mean the children in the leukemia ward at Children's Hospital that will die today? God never makes mistakes. His outcome is always the best outcome. Take it to the bank, saints. We're not going to understand that. Not all the time. We're not even going to see the outworkings, the effects of his decree at all times. But we know he's perfectly wise, and thus we know it's best. It's best. This is why we, we have to love, cherish, cling to a phrase in our Old Testament that no man can thwart his plans because they're the best plans. And we should always rejoice that they are unthwartable and unchanging. This, I think, is some of Paul's thought. After 11 chapters of solid gospel theology in Romans, systematic question and answer, thorough, deep acquaintance with the gospel, Paul's going to say in Romans 11, 33 through 36, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? For who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Unsearchable wisdom. If we don't see it, or if we refuse to see it, it's only our sin and ignorance at work, not any deficiency in God. Five, God's eternal decree is unstoppably powerful. I thought maybe efficacious, but we'll just go unstoppably powerful. London Baptist Confession states this, in which appears his power in accomplishing his decree. You see, God is not one that can say the thing. God can then do everything that he says. Yeah, nobody else can. You can't. I can't. We we can say all sorts of stuff, and we have. And then we haven't done it. We haven't followed through. We'll commit to one thing one day, and the next day we'll break the commitment. Not, not, Not so with God. Isaiah 14, 24 through 27, the Lord of hosts has sworn. What did he say? As I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains trample him underfoot. And his yoke shall depart from them and his burden from their shoulder. That's what he swore to do. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth, not just the Assyrians. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? That'd be a really short list. Proverbs 19:21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. 
Always and forever, brethren, it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Because of his eternal decree. No one can thwart God's purposes and his decree. No one even knows what his purposes are until they are accomplished. Think about that. How are you even going to get a leg up? How are you going to get a head start? You're not. Because you don't even know his purposes until they take place in time. Can you go back in time? Can you undo what the hand of the Lord has done? Of course not. It's silly to even go there. Satan stands watching and waiting just like you and I do. God's decree is only known to him. Hence, it's the secret or unrevealed will of God. It is certain to be accomplished by him who can do all things. And yet, and yet, we're talking about God's eternal decree being unstoppably powerful. This does not, does not involve coercion. He is not manipulating men and moving them as he pleases apart from their free consent and determinations. Now, you're not going to hear me say that man has free will. I don't find that in the Bible. Man has freedom bound by his present disposition. That's different between the unconverted and the converted. That's a different discussion. But man, in a sense, is a free agent. Let me give you an example of this. We know that it was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures and that it was pictured even in the first Passover that the bones of Jesus Christ were not going to be broken in his death. Right? Yeah. And, and so we could say theologically that there is no way under heaven that a single bone of his body will be broken. We could say that with confidence. Because it was according to his degree. And thus it was an impossibility. Yet, without coercion involved, and the Roman soldiers that day being free agents, making their own choices, we see that the Roman soldiers freely chose not to break his bones. No threats from heaven. No coercion by our God and King. They freely chose not to break his bones in time. Unstoppably powerful. Sixth, and we have to hurry. Immutable. Immutable. I, I, I hope you're seeing from some of these things that, that we have, we've already talked about last week, talking about God's freedom because he's spirit, or weeks ago talking about God's immutability. You see, it is the character of God that governs and shapes his decree. His decree is not separate from anything that he is. So his decree cannot be unholy or unrighteous. Do you see? His decree is shaped by all of his attributes, including his immutability. And the London Baptist Confession captured that word, saying unchangeably. Psalm 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. God's decree involves a firm and unchangeable determination on his part to bring every aspect of it to pass. Job 23.13, but he is unchangeable and who can turn him back? What he desires, that he does. Numbers 23.19, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Yes and amen, he will. Jeremiah 4.28, for this the earth shall mourn and the heavens should be dark above. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. This is an immutable decree. Unchanging and unchangeable. Seventh. Why? Why did God decree? For his glory. He does all things for his glory. He was unprovoked. He was unhindered. Not moved upon by any external force. But he willingly 
in his good pleasure, decreed all that he decreed. All that has come to pass, all that ever will come to pass. And he did it for his glory. For his purposes, which lead to his glory. Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. For his glory, his, his purposes. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Application. Four quick things to say. We, when we think about God's decree, we, we should come to the point where we, we see our nothingness apart from God. Why? What, what's the connection there? Um, apart from God's decree, you are nothing. You don't exist. Without God's eternal decree, none of this ever happened. And it just shows us our, our nothingness, our, our emptiness. All right, we're, we're existing right now. We're living and breathing. Our heart is beating because we are upheld by the word of His power. And nothing else. He, he gives life. He takes it. Second, we, we should both acknowledge and adore God's beautiful wisdom that so fashions all of human history and our own individual history and future in a way that brings Him the most glory. That's, a, that's amazing, brethren. Think, think of that. And not just right now, but you, you carry that home in your bosom and you think of that. That's phenomenal. It's, it's more than we can comprehend. You, you want to feel stretched? Think of that. And, and yet, in the end, just adore God in His infinite wisdom. Third, we should learn, because of God's eternal decree, to submit to the one who decreed all things and works all things for our good. We should just learn to be quiet. To be submissive. Not to resist. Not to go to war. Not to take him to task. Not to complain. Not to be bitter. Not to fear. Just to quietly submit. Psalm 39 verse 9. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Job, in the 40th chapter, I put my hand over my mouth. Fourth, and I already hinted at it, we can be encouraged, brethren, to live without fear of tomorrow. Knowing that the God who has eternally decreed all things, is also the God that draws near and is with us. The God whose hand creates all things and holds all things also holds us in the palm of His hand. Psalm 112, verse 7. I will not be afraid of bad news says the ESV translation. My heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. The Belgic Confession, I quoted from it last week, the earliest confession, the mid-1500s, the, the, the earliest Calvinistic confession, rightly puts the humble spirit of a Christian before us. And I'll read, As to what God does surpassing human understanding, we will not curiously inquire into farther than our own capacity will admit of, but with the greatest humility and reverence adore the righteous judgment of God, which are hid from us, contenting ourselves that we are pupils of Christ, to learn only those things which He has revealed to us in His Word, 
without transgressing these limits. God's eternal decree. Amen. We have no time for a quick question. Does anybody have one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, no coercion. God does not coerce men. God is not the author of sin. And everything done is from infinite wisdom.